it's a huge hello from Cambridge Biomedical Campus Wellness Campaign. Wherever you are in the world, a big welcome to you. Today we've got people from Canada, Singapore, Australia and all over the UK, as well as people from the Cambridge Biomedical Campus. So welcome to everybody. The desire for wellness is universal and these webinars aren't just for the 20,000 plus people working on the Cambridge Biomedical Campus. So please feel free to share the links far and wide. Today, I have great pleasure in introducing Molly Miller from the Quadrum Institute in Norwich. Molly will be presenting on the subject of the science of healthy eating. This is the second webinar in our series of three. In two weeks time, we've got Barbara presenting as well. Molly's presentation today is called Fibre, what is it good for? Please put any questions as you think of them in the Q&A and Molly will attempt to answer them after the presentation. So with no further ado, I'll hand over to her. Welcome, Molly. Thank you very much, Jill, for the introduction. Um, so as Jill said, uh, my name is Molly and um, I'll be presenting today on fibre and sort of lots of different topics to do with digestion and the science of the microbiome and lots of kind of individual things um, throughout. So I did want to just say initially that I'll talk for about 25 minutes and I'm very happy to take questions at the end. I think we have a good amount of time to do so. Um, but throughout the presentation, I would like to encourage you to join on the chat uh, in the chat box because I would like to sort of um, get a bit of feedback and discussion about, you know, fibre in general. I'll be asking you guys some questions. So if you want to familiarise yourself with the chat box just now, um, that would be brilliant um, just to get a bit of um, discussion going. I think this is more of an informal presentation. So I'd really like to hear from you all if you have anything you'd like to say or mention. Um, I've got my chat box open, so I'm reading your comments as they come through. So just to go over the idea behind this talk, I think just the title even, Fibre, what is it good for? And I've just put here, <laughs> absolutely nothing. I think there's this conception that fibre is um, a kind of non-essential nutrient. I still see that um, even to this day that people believe that it's non-essential and that it's just kind of roughage and, and that sort of rhetoric. So I kind of wanted to um, really dig into this topic um, as a PhD student doing a, a project which is in fibre and health and just kind of um, move into a space where we can um, kind of try and tr convince you that there's um, lots of reasons why fibre is good for you, why we should eat more of it and how exactly it can benefit health. Um, so yeah, feel free to join me in the chat, say hi, um, and I'm happy to read them when they come through. So I've split this talk into two sections just because I think it's really good to dig down into um, the crux of what I want to talk about. And that is, what is fibre? So we're going to define it. And then secondarily, how can it benefit us and get some into some of the specifics of that? I think um, that's the way I thought of it. And it's the way I approach my PhD project as well. Um, so jumping straight in. So dietary fibre is an umbrella term. So there's a whole range of carbohydrates which are not able to be digested in our small intestine, which is where the majority of our nutrients are absorbed and digested. And they travel through into the large intestine where fermentation occurs. Now, what's really interesting is that adults should consume at least 30 grams of fibre a day. But what we do know is that, you know, as many as nine in 10 people in the UK alone don't get their 30 grams a day. And so there's obviously a need to address this deficit um, and kind of the idea behind studying fibre is to try and you know, find ways to encourage people to see the benefit behind it. Um, I think what's also quite fun about fibre and, and especially in the news and the way we talk about it is that there's lots of different types of fibre. It's not just, oh, fibre is fibre. There's multiple different forms of it. There's multiple different ways that it evades digestion. And there's multiple different ways that we can incorporate it into food or think about ways that we're making meals and stuff like that. So for processing of your food or 
um, cooking of the food can have an impact on the fibre content as well. So what I thought would be quite fun is if we did a bit of a quiz, because I think just to get people thinking about what different types of fibre are present, but also just between two different types of food, which one do you think would have more fibre? So I thought we'd start off with an easier one to begin with. Um, so if you get in your chat box now, we might be able to try and get some answers from you guys. So orange juice versus oranges. If people want to just type in juice or orange, if they think which one has more fiber. So if we got juice on the left and then oranges on the right. So I'm seeing everyone typing in orange, amazing. So this is quite, um, an easy one, I think, because a lot of people think about juicing and they think that juicing removes most of the plant cell wall, which is a type of fibre uh, called cellulose. And so juicing is a form of processing which can decrease um, the amount of fibre in a food. Um, so that's kind of one of the more obvious ones. Moving on into something a bit more tricky. Um, but I think obviously bananas are the most widely consumed food in the world. Um, we can compare two of the exact same uh, type of food, so banana versus banana, but in different stages of ripening. So if people want to put in ripe or unripe, and we can see which one contains more fiber. So unripe, I'm seeing, I'm seeing a couple of ripes as well. So some people think that ripe bananas have more fiber. Some people think unripe. I think as well, some people think because so many people eat bananas, they, they like to think that they're um, having an, a nice bit of uh, nutrients when they're eating it. Um, and this is quite fun because this is relevant to my project actually, because I study a type of fiber called resistance starch. And what happens is in unripe bananas, they contain this type of starch and it's unable to be um, digested by our bodies because it's bananas are usually consumed raw. And what happens over the course of ripening is that the starch is converted by the plant into um, sugars. And that's why yellow bananas taste sweeter is because that starch is being converted into sugar. Um, so that's kind of a fun one to think about is that there's more fiber and that's why it doesn't taste so sweet. And then when you get ripened, it's, it's much more sweet to the taste. So the next one I really like as well because I wanted to compare white rice versus white potatoes. Um, I think if people want to just put in rice potatoes into the cat into the chat box, which one do you think has more? Um, someone says potatoes with skin on potatoes. Yeah, exactly. Someone says rice. Yeah, so skin on. Yeah, skin on. <laughs> I think that's really awesome. So it is actually potatoes. So um, potatoes contain a type of fiber called soluble fiber, whereas white rice contains almost no fiber. So that's because the white rice has had the outer husk removed in the processing, whereas potatoes, especially with the skin on. Um, so it's awesome that people have said that because the skin in the potatoes does contain a lot of fiber, but um, there is in fact, soluble fiber within the white part as well. And I think some people think about white rice and white potatoes as this like evil food. There's this kind of carb war going on about carbs are bad for you and stuff, but there is actually a lot of good stuff in, in these kind of white carbs. And potatoes do in fact contain a, a small amount of fiber and it does add up as you kind of go out through, throughout the day. So, um, oh, just revealed the answer by accident, but um, just on the right here, we have squash versus red wine. So if anyone wants to try and guess squash or red wine, so obviously they're both fruit products. Um, I think we have um, kind of two very different processing of fruits because obviously squash is very refined. And then we have um, red wine is obviously a fermented product. Um, so yeah, red wine, a lot of people put red wine, red wine, please, I'm seeing from Jill. <laughs> red wine contains a small amount of fruit pectin from the grapes and pectin is a type of sort of gelling agent and it's actually what makes jam. So if anyone's made jam before, you'll, you'll notice that um, you need to buy like special sugar with uh, pectin or if you're just using fruit as it is, um, there is natural pectin in a lot of fruits and that's how jam is made basically. And so, the idea of this was not only to show you that there's a wide variety of fiber present um, between the same food. So we've got oranges and bananas between different foods and between different sort of processes of food, the squash processing fruit into that sort of very concentrated um, 
um, product and then wine as a fermented product. What we do have is we've got lots of different um, fibres and all these different things. And I think it's really good to think about how you could be incorporating fibre in lots of different forms. And even in something like the juice, as an example, there is still pectin and soluble fibre in the juice, even with the cellulose removed. And so it's just to get everyone thinking about how ubiquitous fibre is. And, and it's not this scary thing that we need to be eating loads of wheat bran and, and boring things. It is actually something that we can, if we think carefully about it, can actually boost in lots of different individual ways um, and that fiber is not just one thing it's lots of lots of things that are present in multiple forms in multiple foods so I, it would be remiss of me not to mention the main groups which contain um, fiber in general and I just thought it'd be fun to just explain like how how we think about meals or ingredients in terms of some people, um, there was a study done uh, recently, a sort of poll, and I think one in three people thought that eggs contained fiber. So I thought it'd be worthwhile to go over all the main groups which contain fiber. So fiber is predominantly made by plants. So most plant-based foods will contain fiber, um, especially in their natural form, but also in processed forms. And obviously mushrooms are sort of fungi so they're not technically in the plant kingdom so that's why I put them separately and obviously there's so many forms of mushrooms I just I love mushrooms personally so it's maybe a bit of a biased uh, take on it but we have obviously whole grains we've got fruit vegetables and mushrooms nuts and seeds and beans and lentils and so while this kind of some of it can look a bit like bird seed it is also interesting to think about um, these ingredients not just in their whole natural form but in products like bread we've got obviously like dried fruit and fruit products um nut butters nut uh, seed seed butters as well um and we also have things like milled seeds that you can add to things add to meals and then we also have interesting category of beans and lentils which are massively under consumed in the west and they're a phenomenal source of lots of other nutrients like proteins and um minerals and vitamins especially iron so beans and lentils are a very interesting um food group but what's interesting about um in food science at the moment is that we're trying to reformulate familiar foods um with lentils and beans so things like black bean noodles or lentil crisps so it's interesting to sort of think about ways that the food industry is trying to um, increase fiber content of familiar products which will help people to kind of foray into a more sort of healthy um, diet overall. So moving on to the next section how can fiber benefit us I've got loads of amazing comments already in there which I'll try to address at the end um, so I just wanted to move on to the second part um, I think about sort of health and food in three different stages. So I thought I would present it like this here. Um, so we have the nutritional benefits of high fiber foods as, the, as they are. And what I mean by that is that foods that are generally high in fiber, so all the foods that I showed on the previous slide are also generally quite high in other things like iron, micronutrients, vitamins, um, and also polyphenols, especially if you're thinking about colorful fruits and vegetables. Um, you know, polyphenols are a type of antioxidant, so they have lots of different benefits that, um, that can boost your health in lots of different ways. So it's, it's just to make the point that when you're seeking to increase your a variety of different high fiber foods, they also come with a lot of benefits because food is not just one one nutrient or one element there's multiple multiple different things and the foods that are high in fiber also tend to be quite high in these other beneficial um elements um so just something to think about and then we also have um health maintenance so how does increasing or eating your fiber um maintain your health so that's anything from digestion hydration regular bowel movements I think is an obvious one that people think of and also things like staying full so fiber does have impact on um, things like our hunger and how satisfied we are by food and that's something I'll get into um, in the next bit actually um, and then this the third part that I think about is that disease is kind of a process so if we think about 
getting our nutrients and maintaining health. And then also we think about preventing disease process processes from happening or progressing. I think fiber is a, a lot associated with stroke and blood cholesterol, sort of cardiovascular type, because you know we've all seen on um, sort of porridge packets that oats decrease your blood cholesterol and things like that, um, the mechanisms of which are quite well studied. Um, but we also have obviously bowel cancer, so digestive conditions are quite common, commonly associated to be reduced risk if you have um, fib enough fiber in your diet. Um, and then sort of the third one I thought I would mention because not everyone associates fiber with diabetes and insulin control, and it does have an impact. So eating these high fiber foods um, has a multiple mechanistic impact on um, how how glucose enters our body, how efficient our insulin is. And I think that's something that's not super well known when it comes to things like fiber and um, intake of high fiber foods. Um, and then I kind of left field one um which we we will get into as well is immune health um and this is an interesting one because this is more complex because it's it's in it's involved in the gut microbiome and intake of fiber impacting the bacteria and um, all the microbes that are in our gut and that can have an impact on how efficient our immune system is so it's just to show that there's lots of different things you can think about um sort of if you have a goal or if you have something that um, even if it's not a personal goal of yours, but just in general, like human physiology, fiber has such a massive impact on so many different elements of health and disease pre uh, pre prevention. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm happy to um, spread the word about this because I think it's such an important um, element of human diets. So I wanted to tackle um, five main um, impacts that fiber can have in, in particular related to digestion and to do with um, how it impacts the way we eat, especially to do with um, energy intake. And the reason that I wanted to talk about this was because, well, first of all, it explains a lot about digestion and how um, fiber impacts every stage of um, while you're eating it, from mouth all the way down. And so I think it's really fun to think about um, fibers impacting all of these different things. So things like how fast you eat, how full you feel from the food you're eating and how long you feel full for, um, but also lower down um, in terms of later on in the digestive stages is how much carbohydrate fat is actually digested. And then lastly, to do with hunger hormones um, and the gut microbiome. So I thought this would be like a nice story to explain to you all um, how fiber can have an impact on multiple stages of our digestion, in particular to do with um, reshifting an energy balance. Um, so what I mean by energy balance is fiber intake fiber intake can have an effect on how much calorie, how many calories we're getting, um, whether that be in the negative or in the positive, because obviously people might have um, different goals in terms of um, if they want to decrease their calorie intake or increase their calorie intake. Um, and I also wanted to do a bit of a caveat and say that there's obviously a lot of variables um, which can impact um, people's energy intake and balance. And that I'm not an expert in anything medical or dietetic. These are just kind of general information about digestion and how in particular, if, if it was a goal of an individual to uh, leverage these effects and um, to change caloric intake, um, that um, there are ways to do that through fiber, but it's just general information, and not like health advice, if that makes sense. So um, how can fiber impact how fast you eat? So if we look on the left here, uh, we have um, three if we imagine these are three calorically matched, so the, all of these, let's say, contain 100 calories. So I wanted to show how food processing can impact how fast you're going to eat something, and that's directly related to the fiber. So something like juice, where all the fiber has been removed, you can consume the same number of calories from juice four times faster than a puree, and you can consume an apple 11 times slower than juice. So this is to show that fiber impacts eating rate, it can impact appetite control and satiation. And the reasons for this is that obviously there's no intact apple cell walls in the juice. 
And when you process something, it affects the energy density. So a puree has a higher energy density than say an apple. And that's because you're concentrated calories um, into a, say a teaspoon of apple puree will have more calories than a teaspoon of, of apple chunks. And then finally, obviously dietary fiber content is the highest in whole apples. And that's because there's intact cell walls here. Whereas in the other two examples, the cell walls have been disrupted and the fiber content actually decreases even with something like a puree or a smoothie. So secondly, how full you feel from eating is impacted by what the fiber is of the food you're eating. So fiber increases the food volume, which can activate stretch receptors in your stomach. And what this means is that you've got higher volume of food. So we've got the same number of calories again. So beef contains zero grams of fiber, whereas 400 calories of vegetables would be a huge volume of food, but it would be the same number of calories. And the reason for that is because the fiber is increasing the bulk or the volume of the food. And your stomach can sense that. So your stomach can sense when the, the food volume is higher and that makes you feel full. It sends signals to your brain to tell you, wow, that's a lot of food. You know, you might want to slow down or wait until you get hungry again and have your next meal. Fibre also impacts how long you feel full for. Um, so fibre can slow down something called gastric emptying and gastric emptying is simply your stomach contents moving into your small intestine for digestion and so um, some dietary fibers can increase the viscosity of your food content so viscosity just means the thickness of something so if we take water in as, as an example water has um, very low viscosity so it's very very thin runs very easily can drip off a spoon and that's a very low viscous liquid something like honey is the sort of in between is a medium viscosity liquid and that's um, something that will drip slower off a spoon and that's a more viscous um, liquid and then we have um, the example here for viscous fiber so that's something like um, the por porridge oats when you cook them they have this kind of they thick thick in the water and it makes this kind of gloopy um, viscous this viscous fibre is what it's called and this the effect that viscous fibre has on the stomach contents is that it will slow down um, that emptying into the small intestine so it makes you feel fuller for a long time so if you if you think of um, the Belvita breakfast biscuits um, they have that filler for longer and that's because of the fibre content in those as well is because um, they will thicken your stomach contents and it will slow slow down how quickly it's all going to get digested Digested, and that can impact how long you're feeling happy and full for and you won't get hungry as quickly. So as we're talking about the small intestine, the small intestine is the main location of where your nutrients are digested um, enzymatically and they're absorbed into the um, body, into the bloodstream um, through the intestinal wall. And what happens when they leave the stomach and they enter the small intestine is that there's lots of different elements of food. We have these calorically dense um, examples here, fat droplets and starch granules. And these digestive enzymes come in and they'll break them down into their component parts. Um, and it, for, for example, in starch, it would be glucose. So the glucose would be absorbed because it's small enough to get into the bloodstream. Um, but when we introduce fiber into the story, fiber can actually physically impo impose on that reaction and that um, process because it can get in the way of the enzymes latching on and breaking it down. And so foods that are high in fiber actually um, would have a lower caloric kind of load, if you like, because it, the fiber would partially get in the way of um, how much of that is actually digested. And so fiber in that way can decrease nutrient breakdown um, because it interacts with the enzymes. And what that, what that means practically is that it slows down fat and starch digestion. So the final section of this is hunger hormones. And this is something close to my project. So I, I'm really interested in it. And I'd be really happy if there were um, any questions in more detail because I have to very uh, basic um, 
explanation, but just to give an overview, um, we're all kind of told to eat a variety of fiber rich foods and what, you know, encouraging a diverse gut microbiota. But what do all those words actually mean? Um, because we have our we have our colon, we have the foods that we eat, let's say high fiber foods like chickpeas or corn or bananas or potatoes or whatever it is. And we've got bacteria. So what is actually happening when we're eating fiber and what is what impact does it have on our, our um, gut bacteria and our colon? So what we have are bacteria are incredibly important colonizers of the human colon because those other microbes there have their own roles but what they do is they ferment the fiber that makes it there and they have you know beneficial um, elements which can impact our health. So when breaking down um, these different types of fiber as we were saying there's multiple different forms of fiber different origins depending on the processing depending on the ripeness of the fruit etc we have bacteria all specialized to do different things and and break down different types of fiber and what they do with the fiber is they they use it for themselves because they've got more enzymes they've got more capabilities to do that and they're more specialized so they produce these metabolites from from digesting the the fiber and um, some of the metabolites are called short chain fatty acids or scfas and these scfas are um released into the colon and in amongst all the bacteria and they're absorbed by colon cells um, and yeah it's very fascinating metabolite that's constantly being studied and so they they positively impact our health by interacting with the gut lining with the colon cells and by by this interaction they're stimulating release of hormones into the bloodstream and some of these hormones are appetite regulating so they make it to the brain and because of the action of these bacteria fermenting fiber um, your brain is getting a signal saying oh you've got a full stomach and you've had a lot of good stuff and it's basically down regulating your hunger which I think is fascinating and um, to think that um, something like how hungry you are is impacted by the bacteria and the fiber that you're eating is um, very 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 interesting to me so just to finish it off and go to questions um, I just wanted to put a little bit of a slide on some things that um, me and people that I work with we put together um, in terms of boosting fiber intake um, so there's obviously lots of ways you can do this um, there's lots of different strategies or ingredients or products but I think generally variety is a key I think that trying new products new ingredients cookbooks or recipes so you know an example of trying a product as I mentioned like milled seeds or whatever you can buy these like packets in Sainsbury's or whatever and they you can add them to cereals or or even like the neutral tasting ones you can add to you know pasta sauces or chilies and stuff like that um, and that's kind of like one way to go and experiment and to you know swap maybe swap something out so whether it be your morning toast if you wanted to go out and find you know something which has a bit of a higher fiber content and just doing things like that it can kind of change things over time um, and kind of um, swap things out. So another example of doing swap is if you were making bolognese and you wanted to boost the fiber content of that, you could swap the pasta, uh, for example. So you could swap it for a higher fiber pasta, like a whole grain, a whole grain pasta or a lentil pasta. There's lots of those nowadays. Um, or even you could swap out some of the beef uh, for lentils or you could just add lentils, you don't have to take anything away. I think that there's a misconception that you have to overhaul everything and change your whole diet to make a difference. But really like being positive about adding things in rather than like removing things and being grumpy, I think is honestly the way forward. I think um, I watched a, a seminar recently of a professor in London who studies human psychology and that people respond much more beneficially to when they say they're going to try something new or when they're going to add something rather than removing it so I think if you kind of approach it from that way it's like okay how many whole grains did I have today and it's like oh I can maybe try have one more and then it would be like boosting your morale with it um, and that could be for any one of these categories that I kind of lined up um, you could try and get one from each if you wanted to do like a challenge with your workmates or family 
um and just you know experiment have fun with it um i think a lot of the time people think about dietary change they think about miserable deprivation and i think that it really can be fun um and yeah just just explore um go online talk with friends borrow cookbooks off people that you know and stuff like that um yeah so that's kind of my my two cents at the end there um and then obviously we've got Barbara joining as well in two weeks time and she's doing an amazing healthy eating recipe uh, demo um and she's she's obviously great um she's uh, she sits near me at work so it's great um great energy and um she's doing a PhD as well in all this stuff so I think that's me I'll, I'll close off there um I do have a lot of people to thank especially with regards to the content because some of it was actually provided um or collaborated with some of my colleagues Raffaele and Catherine um and uh we actually did a sort of 30 gram fiber challenge over on Instagram um to try and do kind of a fiber February type thing last year um so yeah, thank you so much to Jill for inviting me and I'm happy to take questions. I've seen that there's a few come in, but I'll just kind of stop talking for now and we can see what comes in. Um, I can stop sharing as well, um, but thank you very much to everyone. Molly, that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much and a brilliant presentation, I have to say. Uh, we must have you back on, uh, on another subject of food. Uh, I think uh, lo lo looking at the comments that have come in, it's it's really heartening. So actually, we've got um, a question here. I would like to know the name of the biscuits that made you feel full that you mentioned mm. in relation to viscosity. I think you should be paid by this firm, actually. I was just thinking because um, obviously these products are all you know they're in the supermarket and so i'm not i'm not associated with any brands or companies or anything i should say off the bat um i'm i'm funded by other means by government funding or whatever um so i think the company is it's called belvita um so it's, it's i remember it being advertised a lot when i was at school so it would have been sort of eight nine years ago now um and they're they're breakfast biscuits a lot of biscuits have a higher fiber content just virtue of the fact that they're not super high moisture. So moisture is an important element when you're cooking a starchy food like a biscuit or bread and how hydrated the ingredients are will impact how much fiber is left in the final product. And so biscuits are generally higher in fiber because they're so low moisture. Um, and those are bre breakfast biscuits are being developed with various ingredients and whole grains. And basically they're sort of they're convenience products to help you fill fill the gap and they they loiter in your stomach because of that viscosity I was talking about. They are um, generally associated with feeling fuller for longer. And that's just that's not even just to do with the whole grain aspect. It's sometimes to do just with like the fact that it's getting hydrated in your stomach and it will slow down how quickly it moves through your digestion. So next question. When is it better to have a low fiber diet? So, as I said before, obviously I'm not a medical person or a nutrition expert um, in a medical sense or dietitian or anything. Um, I know of instances where low fiber diets are useful. I think especially to do with IBS, there's certain types of fiber which can trigger um, inflammation or symptoms of irritable, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, so there are instances where low fiber diets are encouraged. Um, uh, but, but the main thing about that is that choosing your fiber sources wise, uh, wisely, because some fiber sources are good for bulking your stool, whereas some fiber sources are really good for fermentation and those two things serve different purposes in the body so if you have um, a lot of bloating you might want to eat fewer uh, types of fiber which encourage fermentation and more of the types that just bulk your stool and help move things along like fiber is supposed to so there's lots of different sort of ways that that you can eat fiber um, depending on your own physiology or your own conditions um, but yeah, that's obviously personal to the individual as well. Um, but yeah, I think the other example I could think of is um, oh no, I don't, I don't think that is 
no so I, I don't know if I'm the right person to ask about that because I'm not a medical professional um but yeah that was maybe just one example is IBS is a big one with to do with fiber intake lovely thanks Molly so we've got plenty more questions I've switched to brown rice not me but the person mm -hmm. posting in the chat I've switched to brown rice and there's white rice and this white rice has no nutritional value, only consume potatoes once in a blue moon as I've reduced carb intakes. Mm -hmm. So brown rice as opposed to white rice? Um, I think the fibre content of brown rice and white rice is quite similar. I know that there's, um, there's definitely a lot of minerals in the husk that makes brown rice um, brown. It's the, uh, some of that outer uh, layer of the grain has been included. I prefer I prefer brown rice personally because I prefer the taste, but I'm not sure they're um, so different in terms of fiber content. They're obviously every little helps. So if you like mm. brown rice, I think that's amazing. That's interesting um, because I always assumed that there was. So I've gone for mm. brown rice because yeah. I think it's better for me. And in fact, you're saying I, yeah. I could just eat too white rice and enjoying it. Yeah, I think if you if you enjoy brown rice, I think it's great, but I don't think it, it's life changing. It's, it's oh. like that with everything, like a lot of a lot of diet and health is to do with your dietary pattern rather than individual ingredients. Um, but I would say that if you have a normal sort of uh, like you're not diabetic or you don't have any impairments to do with your insulin, there's nothing wrong with white rice if you've got a normal physiology I think that white rice and brown rice are quite comparable um you know there's there's a lot of talk about carbohydrates in the diet um which are a lot of the time contentious but there's nothing wrong with carbohydrate intake as long as you have a normal um insulin response lovely next question is it possible to change your gut biome to make it more effective I've heard that people have fecal transplants to improve mm. their gut bacteria. Interesting. Mm. So the gut microbiome is very changeable to do with your diet. So even within the course of a few days, your entire composition of your gut microbiome can change if you've if you've drastically changed your diet. Um, so, you know, that could be anything from going vegetarian overnight um, to try, you know, maybe you're on a special diet because you're going to the hospital or something like that and um, there can be lots of different reasons why people change their diet but what the main thing is that if you do change something and you change it um over the course of a few days and you're eating something different to what you were before your gut microbes will adapt and change in abundance depending on what new substrates or new food sources are reaching the colon so it, let's say you don't eat a lot of um, a broccoli or something um, and then you start eating loads of broccoli, you'll end up with, with bacteria in your gut, which are good at degrading the types of fiber which are present in broccoli and vegetables. And you do see that when people go vegetarian. So their, their gut bacteria will be more like vegetarian type gut bacteria. Um, and they're more, they're more adapted to digesting these fiber and carbohydrates. Whereas people who eat a lot of meat, they've got bacteria in their, their colons, which um, degrade proteins. So it is very reproduci uh, reproducibly changeable. Um, to do with fecal transplants, um, that is a therapy that's very specific to certain um, illnesses and disease processes. So especially in hospitals, we have um, a hospital acquired uh, C. difficile infections, and that's a very very high mortality rate um gastrointestinal disease and that is very well treated with um microbi uh, microbiota transplants or fecal transplants um so that's one instance where it's very um it's very well studied and it's something that's very effective for that condition but in terms of changing your microbiome through that therapy for other conditions it's not very well studied yet and it's still many years to come for that specific um, therapy. Uh, what soluble fiber, what is soluble fiber and how does it give us benefits e.g reducing serum cholesterol levels? So this is 
wor the work of uh, one of my colleagues who helped um, put together some of the content last year for this presentation. So she studies why, uh, why fibre, um, especially soluble fibre, can decrease cholesterol. Um, in simple terms, the, the fibre in the um, intestines um, can bind to bile salts, um, uh, bile, and it basically draws uh, cholesterol from the blood and binds to the fibre. And that's how it works. It's basically drawing cholesterol from the blood and binding to it and, you know, reducing your blood cholesterol that way. And so that's, that's how it works. It's fascinating stuff, but there's a lot of mechanistic things that need to be studied on that as well. Fascinating, isn't it? As an organic whole food vegetarian for the last 30 years, I already seem to be doing most of this, but even I struggle to get 30 grams of fibre into my food every day. I already eat lots of nuts, beans, lentils, etc. Is the 30 gram target a bit too high? Hmm. I think for that specific example, you, yeah, you, you would need to look at what else you're eating because um, the British Nutrition um, Organization, they, they've done um, lots of polling and um, studies on the British public to do with fibre intake. And the largest contributor to fibre intake are whole grains. Um, so a lot of that can be sort of brown bread and, and whole grain pastas and whatnot, um, all that sort of thing. And so a lot of people are also at the same time decreasing their whole grain intake because they're scared of carbohydrates. And so it could be that, you know, for example, I'm not saying this is um, you, but you could be eating lots of nuts, bees and lentils, but maybe you're not eating a lot of whole grains um, or maybe vegetables are too bulky because what I was saying earlier about the, the volume of food, especially to do with fibre, is that it's very difficult to eat a huge portion of something because of the bulk that fiber can provide. Not everyone has the stomach capacity to eat a huge bowl of vegetables. And so that's where getting your calories from other more dense sources or lower fiber sources comes in because obviously you want to be getting enough energy and you don't want to be stuffed full all the time. Um, but yeah, I don't think the 30 gram target is too high because I know that these recommendations are based on sort of ideal levels for preventing disease at a very baseline level. And we also know from other studies of other countries where fibre intake is as high as 30 or above that they are they have a higher longevity, they have lower rates of age related diseases. And so that's why it's been set at 30, but I can totally understand why it would be really hard to get up to 30 um, because it's just a lot of food sometimes. Um, I know myself because I eat a lot of, a lot of high fiber foods um, as well, but um, sometimes you just can't eat as much as, as much as you need to, as much vegetables and whatnot. So, so what happens be tricky. then Molly? What happens if we over consume fiber? That's another question that's mm. coming. So there are, so following on from the last one, actually, because you can eat like so much fiber in the form of vegetables or, or fruit, especially if they're raw, um, you might end up under eating calories. So that's one side effect um, that could happen, um, which is obviously a negative because if you do that over a long period of time, you could end up being underweight. Um, in terms of things like bloating or if you're eating a specific type of fiber that irritates you and it can cause really painful bloating I think that can be a negative um but if we over consume fiber and there's there's no reason that it, it doesn't make you you're not in pain um or anything I can't think of anything that would ne negatively happen other than you'd be going to the bathroom a lot of times during the day um which might not be a negative, but depending on your job, you might not want to be going five times a day. <laughs> um, so that's maybe one thing that you could that you could say. Um, uh, another question here is inulin a good source of fiber? So inulin is a type of fiber um, and it's a fermentable fiber. So um, there's lots of studies and even food products which contain inulin from things like chicory. 
Um, they can be irritating to some people. Um, so inulin is one of those ingredients which is great for bacterial fermentation and all those benefits from the fermentation process. Um, so that's why some products are supplemented with inulin because it, it, it boosts the fiber content and it helps your gut bacteria flourish. Um, yeah, so it is a good source of fiber, yes. <laughs> Excellent. Um, are you cooperating with the Zoe team health <coughs> studies, Tim Spector and his team? So Tim, Tim works in London, I believe, for one of the universities. So he conducts his own research and obviously he's got his um, Zoe app, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm not personally associated with Tim. I don't know him personally. Um, but from what I understand, he's got his own research um, going on and he works with, I guess he does collaborations with other people as well. Um, in Norwich at the research park um, in particular, we're near the hospital and we do a lot of our own um, collaborations locally. So we do work with um, Imperial College London for certain nutrition trials with humans. Um, but we do so much at Quadrum um, anyway. So it's kind of like, there's so much collaboration across different people in the nutrition realm. And um, some people just have their own little pockets of what they're doing and might just, you know, there might be overlap, but it might just be that we're separate actually. Uh, someone's just put in the chat, Zoe is crowdsourcing data. Is that a negative comment or is that just a statement? It's a statement. It's okay. a statement. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so moving on, um, you've just mentioned some, that some fibres are better for stool bulking. Mm -hmm. I never thought I'd be sitting on a webinar saying that. But anyway, <laughs> you've just mentioned some fibres are better for stool bulking and others for feeding the fermenting gut bacteria. Can mm. you say more about the different types of fibre and their roles stroke benefits please mm. so I didn't go into specifics because it would take a long time to go through each type of fiber and what their role is or benefits are I could have done that but I thought it'd be better to cover you know digestion and all that kind of stuff and just give an overview um so yeah I mean you could even look this up I think on NHS website there's information on um, types of fibres which are good for stool bulking. Um, so things like cellulose um, are good for bulking stool because they're not that well fermented. They actually just add that bulk and they, they also hold water. So they hydrate your stool and they help with, um, with uh, bowel movements. But um, for gut from fermentation, you've got lots of different other types of fiber, oligosaccharides, resistant starches, fermentable by a few different types of bacteria. Um, and fermentation is so important as well. So that's what I was saying about variety is that, you know, don't just focus on one type of fiber. It's really great to try and do multiple, try and sort of get multiple different types throughout the day or throughout the week. Um, so that's kind of where all those food groups come in, you know, nuts, seeds, vegetables, potatoes, whole grains, lentils and beans. They've all got a huge variety of different fibres which help with multiple different things, all the way from stool bulking to fermentation. And all of them are important. So it's like mostly just about trying to get that variety in. And obviously that's difficult and some people don't like certain ingredients and things. But that's kind of what we mean by variety is that because there's so many functions, try and get a bit of everything. Mm. We've got one last question here, unless anybody else is going to post anything in the chat or the Q&A. And this final question is, what are the best fibres with anti-inflammatory properties? Um, I'm not sure if you could say that they're anti-inflammatory. I know that anti-inflammatory is a kind of buzzword in nutrition um, and trying, a lot of people are concerned about inflammation, immune response, immunity. Um, so I would hesitate to give examples, um, but I would say that some fibers promote inflammation because they irritate the gut and that's because they've got maybe somewhere on the IBS spectrum. Um, so certain types of fibers, so I mentioned on one of the earlier slides, FODMAPs, 
they are kind of like oligosaccharides, small, small, uh, short chain carbohydrates. Um, and they, they can promote kind of an inflammatory response in the gut because they are not well received by the gut bacteria. They're kind of irritating. Um, and that's why people go on a low FODMAP diet. And so that basically is a form of an elimination diet where you reduce these FODMAPs and foods which contain FODMAPs and um, things like onions and garlic and they can be they can promote bloating and be really painful um, but those are specific regimes for people with um, like symptoms like gastrointestinal symptoms um, so for a normal person I don't think you could give a recommendation and say okay this fiber is anti-inflammatory I could be wrong but I don't think you could attribute it and say that it's definitely going to reduce your inflammation especially in the body as a whole I would say that maybe locally in the gut um but possibly not in general to do with your body um but maybe maybe what you meant I'm not sure if you can write back but maybe what you meant was the immune promoting properties of fiber and that's to do with the interaction with the bacteria in the gut and so um having lots of food and and fiber types in the gut helps the bacteria stay happy and they help your mucus lining in the colon stay really thick and prevent pathogens from getting in. And so that can be one way to sort of, you know, decrease, you know, pathogenic processes and help your mucus nice and healthy in the gut lining. And that's basically just because you're feeding the bacteria all this great stuff and they're loving it. <laughs> that's basically what's happening. Always good to know. Um, so we've got somebody coming in um, similarly. Is low fibre a good anti-inflammatory? Mm. Yeah, so I think I tried to cover that as well. Um, I don't think I can comment on that. As I said, I don't think that there's many, many things you could say to do with directly fibre and, and inflammation. And, and the lady who, um, who asked the previous question, uh, mm. is saying sorry I meant what type of food is good for that mm. and immune yes I've RA rheumatoid arthritis so I'm interested okay. in any foods to help mm. so to do with foods and inflammation um, again that's not my area so I'm not sure if I can comment on that I know I've got anecdotal I've got my grand's got arthritis so I know that she avoids things like nightshades um, tomatoes and aubergines and whatnot um but that's not I don't think that's related to fiber and you'd have to talk to your doctor about that I'm afraid lovely well I think that seems to be all the questions Molly so thank you Brilliant. to everybody thank you very much Polly for an amazing presentation thank and thank you to everybody who's who's joined us today and who's subsequently tuning in to the recording so in two weeks time that's tuesday the 15th of march we've got the final webinar in this series the science of healthy eating and we'll be welcoming barbara nemakova and she's also from the quadrum institute as molly mentioned earlier and her talk's called ready steady cook and she's going to talk to us about food and also give us a cookery demonstration i've seen it and it's good so for more details of other webinars coming up in the CBC Wellness Campaign series and to book, just search Eventbrite CBC WC. If you miss any of these webinars, and if you'd like to catch up on the first one of these series, simply go to the Cambridge Biomedical Campus YouTube channel. If any of you have any ideas for future wellness campaign webinars, do get in touch with me via Eventbrite. It's lovely to have seen you all today. We very much look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks' time for the final webinar in this series. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jill.